All right. So, Gorilla, pretty popular paper in the community. I'm sure you guys have uh, heard of it or at least seen it around. I'm sure a good amount of you have already read it. Um, it's not the hardest paper to digest in the world. Um, on the left here, it's, it's quite simple. They're just creating instruction pairs using APIs, and then they're fine tuning a 7 billion um, parameter llama model. Um, and then they're just a good portion of the paper is just them evaluating the performance of the model. Um, I guess the other thing to add is that they, they did use a retriever and then they uh, saw how good it would be with and without a retriever. Um, I figured it would be good to go to, um, I guess, is my stream still running? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I guess uh, I thought it would be first good to go to kind of a, a general overview. This is um, essentially a visual abstract of the system. Um, you'll understand this better as we go, but essentially they have this model that was trained on, um, you know, these API calls, uh, uh, instruction completion sets, which they converted into a JSON. They fine tune this model, um, and then given, you know, given uh, a prompt, uh, it can then see what API needs to call, so it retrieves the correct base documentation. Um, and then it, uh, you know, is trained fine tune on API calls. So then it uh, outputs the correct API call, and you see the the result that you that you want to see. Um, so um, this is obviously very valuable for AutoGPT because uh, we're working with tools here, and uh, one of the big things is if we can, you know, communicate with any arbitrary API. Um, and just some overview stuff is, as we all know, LLMs are, you know, they are constrained to what is in their parameters. So, um, they, as, as, as we see with ChatGPT, their, their knowledge cutoff is essentially, um, where, when they were trained. And so 2021, uh, I think it's October or something like that is when, um, GPT-3 was trained. And so no more you can't act, access any information after that um, which is obviously a bummer uh, for something like auto gpt um and uh this paragraph is essentially saying um we grant access to vastly larger and training knowledge bases and accomplish complex computational tasks uh basically augmenting llms is the path that we need to go uh, instead of just having this black box model with an input output um yeah, and then and then the whole thing I mentioned with um with calling APIs. Um, this is an example of hallucination that currently exists. So, obviously, GPT four um is outdated, so it gives you the wrong response. Um, Claude may have uh you know uh something that gone wrong, so they gave you the wrong information, but Gorilla retrieves the the correct thing from the uh from the library. Um, and you can see they have, that they have some nice graphs here that show that Gorilla is the best uh, for every metric. Um, they use a few different retrievers, which we'll cover um, later on. And in general, uh, it's better, but also another interesting thing that uh, I think was kind of underrated about this paper is that GPT 3.5 is better in many ways uh, for this kind of task than GPT-4. Um, and you'll see that later they hypothesize about that being due to RLHF. Um, so yeah. Um, also, just want to say, if anyone wants to jump in or say anything, welcome to an open discussion. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, so yeah, they, they construct a essentially a collection of APIs. Uh, or API uh, references um, using, you know, Torch, Tensor, and Hugging Face. Um, and uh, they synthetically generate uh, user question prompts uh, with the API using self-instruct. And, uh, you know, it's basically creating the right training data for uh, fine-tuning um, Llama. Uh, the other thing 
that's important that they mention throughout the paper is constraints, um, which we'll see later as well. Um, these ones, uh, I guess this paragraph is just, there are large language models. This is what the paper is based on. Um, and it's just like the big model references. Um, this uh, second paragraph um, is kind of the, the meat and potatoes of this paper. Um, uh, this tool usage section, it basically talks about how instead of creating specific APIs, you are given uh, basically an open field of different arbitrary APIs to call. Um, in their case, it's obviously constrained to uh, model APIs, so specifically from Torch, Hugging Face, uh, or TensorFlow. Um, and the last thing is program synthesis. Um, I wrote a note here um, that, uh, you know, program synthesis is essentially just instructing a language and then you execute in code. So not too complicated. Um, but in terms of making LLMs be good at it, um, as they say, it's not only complex, but it's also hard to verify and evaluate. API calls, on the other hand, function more like tool usage. This allows the LLM to significantly expand its capabilities without grappling with low-level implementation details. Uh, so essentially, right now, AutoGPT has to, uh, you know, if it wants to create a new tool, it writes code itself and, and installs the necessary libraries versus an API is essentially pre-written functions for certain things. Um, yeah, so this is, this is essentially the note I have here is, Auto GPT gives you access to, uh, it'll give you access to unique functions. Um, in terms of how they actually did it, uh, as I mentioned, they collected uh, their API data from the Model Hub, PyTorch Hub, and TensorFlow Hub models. Um, and uh, I mean, the details of this don't matter too, too much, but one really important thing um, was that. Many of them poor documentation, lack dependencies, and have no information, and so they filter them out. Uh, in terms of AutoGPT, that's more of an issue because the search space is more uh, unconstrained, um, and you know we can't predetermine which APIs have good documentation or not. So if we were to implement a system like this, there could be some sort of uh, middle of the ground fallback mechanism that checks the most recent. Uh, answers on Stack Overflow or like other deterministic sources that basically um, don't have to force the LLM to rely on uh, the knowledge in its own weights. Um, and yeah, the result is they have 925 models that they can potentially call through this uh, gorilla, um, through, through the gorilla model. Um, and we went over this um, to make you know a little bit more sense now. Uh, you know, this is what we were talking about with them synthetically generating the instruction API pairs. Um, you know, this is them uh, curating the data set for the API database. And then obviously you ask a question, um, it retrieves the information and then generates a prompt, which we will see later how that looks, uh, and then calls the API. Um, we converted the model cards for each of these calls into a JSON object with the following fields, domain, framework, functionality, API name, API call, API arguments, environment requirements, example code, performance, and description. Uh, so this is what the JSON object looked like for each of those APIs. Um, um, so this is, this is them actually creating a prompt. Um, you know, they told it to refrain from using any API names or hints when creating the prompt. They provided three in context examples along with the reference API. Um, and then they constructed um, six like handwritten examples for each of the three model hubs um, that essentially serves as templates for all of the APIs within each of those hubs. Uh, and that's the only, you know, hand generated data that they used. Um, and then they use GPT for uh, the most powerful model to uh, actually generate the synthetic data. Um, so if we go to the appendix here, this is what uh, one of their API calls look like with, with everything combined. 
um, they have you know the user query, um, what domain it is, like basically all the stuff from the JSON, the API call, what the API call looks like, the provider, uh, an explanation of it, and then the code, and then obviously the reference API if it if it is pulled, and then um, they pass this into the model uh, into the uh, fine tuned gorilla model, which then gives them that information. Put the link here back up. Okay, well, the link back up isn't working, so I have to scroll. Um, where were we? Here. Cool. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, they had to have, uh, you know, user agent uh, queries in order to find fine tune the model. If you've experimented with fine tuning DaVinci, it's very similar um, to that. Uh, and then also they train Gorilla with and without a retriever. So essentially with and without the ability to uh, pull the API documentation for a specific um, query, user query. Um, you know, they mentioned, they mentioned constraints uh, and, you know, parameter size and lower bound on accuracy since they are calling uh, models specifically. Um, this is what's important to them, constraints like parameter size and lower bound on accuracy. Uh, but uh, actually here they, they give an example, um, invoke an image classification model that uses less than 10 million parameters, uh, but maintains an image net accuracy of at least 70%. And obviously this is tough because you need to know all the nuances and constraints um, of all these you know, different models. And that becomes, again, an even harder problem when you apply that to um, you know, auto GPT, because there's not just constraints of parameter size and lower bound, there's environment constraints, there's constraints on uh, you know, how much money you can spend. Uh, even the fact that there are so little constraints in such an unconstrained space also makes it tough. Um, and then, yeah, like if they use, if it's with a retriever, then they append the retriever to the prompt, uh, as I showed earlier. And with this, they're hoping that the LLM basically uses the second half of the prompt in order to answer the first enough so the user query and the and the um the user query and the, and the basically the json of the model and api reference um and yeah this this is essentially them saying like uh allowing you to have a reference means that even as you know documentation updates you can still uh call the documentation uh or, or not hallucinate random documentation um yeah, yeah, hallucination, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, so in obviously that they again, this is kind of repeating the same thing. They have they have a zero shot model that they trained, which is uh, just uh, a, you know just basically ChatGPT. You just say a prompt, and uh, it repeats or gives you information. Uh, just with the with the prompt from the JSON, and they have the retrieval one where obviously it pulls from the database and gets you the correct documentation. Uh, and another interesting thing is that they have the document or the the code on GitHub for Gorilla, but it's mainly just the fine tuning code and a way to call the model. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen uh, what the actual like how they invoke the APIs are. Um, but like, for example, over here, they have this, um, this is their, their collab notebook. They have a get gorilla response, but I couldn't find that anywhere uh, in their, uh, I couldn't find that anywhere in their GitHub. Um, yeah. The, the way they evaluated all of this was uh, AST subtree matching. Um, I asked ChatGPT just to make me a, a succinct description of what it is um, and essentially breaks down the path if you imagine a URL almost it breaks it down from the base URL down to the uh, leaf node to so the last slash um, uh, so it matches a given pattern or structure a tree-like representation of the syntactic structure of a program where each node corresponds to a specific construct in this case uh, a specific you know uh, 
API call paths. Um, yeah, and this is uh, the visual representation of, of what I just mentioned. So they have this call, um, this this uh, API call, and you know this creates essentially a tree, which is then referenced against the actual Torch Hub tree, and you can see that there is a match. Uh, torch hub load vision 121 and pre trained true, so it is not a hallucination. Um, the other thing that was actually, I think I skipped this section. Uh, yeah, I did skip this section. Um, yeah, inductive program synthesis again, this is just the code generation um, test case. Oh, the, this is them saying why they, they used AST instead of some uh, a regular metric. Um, test cases fall short, short when evaluating API calls, uh, as it is often hard to verify the semantic correctness of code. Um, uh, for example, the task of classifying an image, uh, there's 40 different models that can be used for the task. Even if we were to narrow it down to a single family of uh, DenseNet, there are four different configurations possible. Hence, there exist uh, multiple correct answers, and it's hard to tell if the API being used is functionally equivalent to the reference API by unit tests. So that's why they didn't use unit tests, and instead they used this uh, subtree matching technique uh, that I just went over. Um, and uh, one thing, one thing that uh, the reason I remember that I forgot this paragraph is I thought this was uh, pretty interesting. The fact that they specifically mentioned that. Hallucination is, is different than an error. Um, basically saying that even if you get it wrong, there's there's two ways of getting it wrong. So I, I do wonder if uh, there's some sort of way to differentiate between those things in AutoGPT as well, if hallucination versus a uh, an error. Uh, like for example, like going down the wrong loop versus not being able to execute a loop, um, if that makes sense. Um, then we get to the evaluation section, which is which is them putting everything together. Um, and if if anyone has any questions up to this point, feel free to feel free to to ask. I'll, I'll give it like maybe five seconds. I have something. Um, so the system seems, you know, if there's a, a nefarious API, it seems like it could cause quite a lot of problems. So we'd be able to set up some kind of red flag system if you know an API starts getting a bit naughty. I mean, if if we call if the LLM calls an API and the API is like uh, malicious. Uh, yeah, uh, two seconds. Oh, where was it? Uh, API reliability. The reliability of external APIs can impact the performance of the Gorilla system. Regular monitoring adaptation to changes in APIs will be crucial to maintain the system, uh, especially within the chain of thought system. Uh, systems generate comparative and rich contextual chain of thoughts. But um, yeah, the, the main issues that it seems to be with the system though is APIs, you know, bias and fairness. Chosen API is essential to ensure responsible and unbiased system behavior. Uh, and dependency, you know, I'm sure not all APIs will perform the same. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the it is a fundamental issue when you, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you can't pick and choose the API like we don't have a curated data set of which documentation is good. Um, but also, uh, as Nintendo mentioned, guardrails and uh, it does run if you run within Docker, then it doesn't have pseudo access, so it can't, you know, uh, do anything too malicious. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. Um, as mentioned, they can adapt to test time changes, meaning if documentation changes, they can retrieve the correct documentation. Um, and you know they do they do it four different things. They have zero shot retrieving, which is no retrieving essentially, you're just passing these query. Um, they have BM twenty five which I, I did put a brief summary here, but this isn't the point of this. Um, it's basically just an improvement on one of the 
uh, first ways to, um, you know, analyze the similarity between two texts, uh, TF, IDF. Um, I'll leave this open for a sec, so you could read it if you'd like. Um, but uh, essentially what they're doing is they pass the user's query through um, one of these metrics and retrieve the correct uh, API. Um, and since, uh, actually, yeah, they also used uh, GPT index. Uh, I wasn't actually too sure what it meant to use text DaVinci or DaVinci 3 as a retrieval model, whether it meant like which of these API calls are the most similar or which API call we should use. So if anyone, if anyone knows or understands how they use DaVinci 3 for similarity, I'd love if you could speak up. Um, if not, they also used Oracle Retriever, uh, which, as they mentioned, basically helps you highlight the areas where, uh, you know, better retrievers could change the performance of the system and provide suggestions uh, or examples when you, you just need to use the API uh, in, in a better way. Um, and yeah, they just regarding, mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, regarding text Da Vinci, uh, my guess would be maybe they mean uh, they use their embedding API with this model. Also, it's weird that they would choose this model because uh, OpenAI people, when it comes to using embedding API for for vector embedding, they recommend using less powerful models than this one. But other than that, I would I would assume that maybe they're talking about vector embedding, their embedding API. Because yeah. you can use all the same models uh, to get the vector embedding. But text DaVinci 3 isn't an embedding model. Uh, Ada is the name of <clears throat> uh, the state of the art open AI embedding model. Text DaVinci um, is like a earlier GPT 3 variant, I think. Oh, you mean you mean the the models for embeddings and the models for text completion are different models? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I. I'm sorry for that. Then I was under assumption that those are the same models. <laughs> sorry. No it's it's a valid point. They they probably did mean Ada. The 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 embedding model, as as Sam mentioned, um, that's an it's, it's an interesting typo though. I don't know. But yeah, then they use this uh you know the the AST tree, um, to you know see what hallucinates and how accurate certain things are. Um, and they essentially find that this 7 billion parameter model um, performs as well as other state-of-the-art models, uh, and in, in a lot of cases, better. Um, and again, you'll see you'll see some interesting trends where uh, in a lot of these, you know, evaluations and run and accuracy and, and hallucination runs, you'll see that GPT 3.5 performs better than GPT 4. Um, so I don't know, like. Again, something interesting that I think was under underappreciated um, in this paper. Um, and then one thing that they that they do mention is that uh, fine tuning is better than retrieval because they ablate uh, fine tuning and, or, or retrieval and no retrieval, and they find that fine tuning was uh, better. Um, even and you know when they put the ground truth. It, Separate from that point, when they put the ground truth retriever versus using uh, one of the retrievers mentioned, um, it performed worst, which essentially just translates to the, um, you know, whatever retrieval mechanism they have isn't perfect. Um, and, you know, non optimal retriever test time will sometimes misguide the model and result in more errors, which is intuitive, but also hard to test. Um, it, means that uh you know you can't just slap on an embedding model you do have to check and see quantitatively if it performs better and yeah they, they fine-tune base llama um and yeah the the ground truth retriever achieves better results and yeah current retrievers still have a gap a big gap between the ground truth uh retriever um this is this is essentially just them uh showing 
you know, documentation updates uh, where the default response will be, uh, you know, in an old model, and then they're able to essentially update the model repository given uh, documentation with the retriever. And yeah, they, they do mention that GPT-3.5 has less hallucination errors. Um, this finding is also consistent for the settings when various retrieving methods are provided. This may suggest that RLHF plays a central role in turning the model to be truthful. Um, I thought that GPT-4 was also RLHF, so I don't know if this is specifically the reason why GPT-3.5 performs better. Maybe there's been more... Um, you know, more RLHF that has gone into 3.5. Um, but if anyone has any hypotheses or, or anything to share on this, we'd, we'd love to hear. Yeah, I do believe the main differences between GPT-3 and 3.5 Turbo are a lot more RLHF, uh, which is what enabled, like, chat GPT to be so useful. Um, GPT-4 definitely still has a lot of RLHF, but I think... Uh, Comparatively to how much larger GPT-4 is in model size by parameter, it has a comparatively smaller amount of RLHF by ratio. Gotcha, gotcha. So they just need more RLHF to achieve, uh, achieve the same result. Makes sense. Maybe, yeah. That makes sense then. And yeah, they repeat themselves again with the documentation changing. Um, they, you know, they say again that retriever aware training could adapt to the the changes, um, and maintains accuracy and relevance over time. Adapts to the pace of updates, um, and here they mention other constraints in the case of RESTful APIs. It could be could be cost of each invocation, uh, latency of response, and uh, you know they ablated uh, study that they created uh, an underlying ablation study evaluating the ability of different models and zero shot with retriever settings given accuracy constraints um, and they provide an example here if the user were to ask for an image classification model that achieves at least 80 percent top one accuracy on the ImageNet data set then while both are classification models hosted by torch hub res next 101 32 by 16 d with a top one accuracy of 84.2% would be the right model whose API to call and not uh, the other model which has a lower accuracy. So uh, kind of nuanced constraints that are specific to calling models. Um, and there would be a ton more constraints under a ton more different circumstances if you have an unconstrained search space as you do with uh, AutoGPT. Um, conclusion, I guess this is just a repetition of everything that we went over. Um, honestly, not the most uh, difficult paper to understand, but it is quite important. And uh, certainly there's different things that we can see how we can implement into our system uh, from you know just using Gorilla on its own or a Gorilla-like model to you know be able to know when to select the right APIs. So maybe we're using GPT 3.5 that says, okay, we want to create a tool and then it calls the Gorilla model and the Gorilla model can find the correct uh, API. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, ways to, you know, test hallucination versus uh, errors. Um, so yeah, that's that's Gorilla. Uh, so open the floor if anyone wants to, wants to say anything. When they say hallucination here, it specifically refers to hallucination of APIs, right? Uh, it refers to when a user asks uh, a query, let me see if, yeah, so that is that is API, not just like if you if it's hallucinating a wall of text, this does nothing to it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it is specifically referring to you know this is this, this is, is the exactly. wrong. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say this is still API, so this is not wall of text that is preventing. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation, Sam. Um, what practical utility do you? see in this what um what what exactly is the setup for gorilla is is it just an llm that they fine-tuned on a whole bunch of api calls um there's they talk about a retrieval system but i didn't see that clearly diagrammed out anywhere um 
how do you keep this thing up to date with a a, a cutting edge API like a and a new update comes out to the API today and what do you do you need to do a round of fine tuning on gorilla no so what they did um was they essentially fine tuned uh with the original prompt which was I'll go back to the appendix you'll see they had the the original completion of They had the original completion of the stuff in the JSON. And then with a retriever, they then included the reference API. And so the goal of that is so that the model hopefully can uh, understand uh, when you pass in documentation from the database in the future, uh, as, as you saw with the, the original uh, diagram uh, at the top, then it can essentially better understand that it needs to use that second half that references the API, the up-to-date API, in order to update its uh, fine-tuned information. So the idea is that you're continually fine-tuning the model with updated information? Not, not as far as I understand. I think they just fine-tuned it once, and they, uh, they just made it really good at understanding how to integrate updated documents that are retrieved from the API. What's detail on the information retriever is it a vector search jobby no uh, as they mentioned it they're using a few different ones um but they use they use a bm25 they use uh i'm assuming an embedding model and then an oracle retriever i'm not super clear on what an oracle retriever is um how it's different from the others um but yeah i'm not even sure what a bm25 is so uh, BM25 is like a classic uh, ranking algorithm from uh, like the 70s. I, I'll drop a link in the chat to it. Uh, so it's like a classical um, approach to how to rank and determine relevance because I'm pretty sure uh, the retrieval uh, part component is trying to figure out which API to use, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so then I think with the ranking, they're somehow using the difference between either some embedding or the natural language description of the user's query and then wrecking that compared to the description of the APIs. Um, and then that's for BM25. For GPT index, which uses text DaVinci, I'm, it sounds like they're using a natural language prompt where they're giving uh, text DaVinci 3 a bunch of API descriptions and the user's query and asking it which one is the most likely to be relevant. And then the Oracle Retriever, um, I'm not totally sure what their implementation is, but just by Oracle, they mean it has some absolute higher knowledge that it's able to access and it's an external resource uh, that's able to get ground truth from. Like the original documentation, for example. Exactly, yeah. Uh, are we gonna let Voyager access these external APIs? We could, there's nothing stopping us, I guess. I mean, this is uh, essentially a tool that we can use to, to you know, plug into anything else. I guess if, if Void, or if like, we implement the ideas from Voyager into IOGPT, it'll mean that IOGPT has full access to a Linux container, so it can write scripts and write REST calls to access any API on the web. So unless you, forbid it or cut it off from the internet and don't allow its code to make calls out to the external internet, it would be able to use all of this. Yeah. What oh, benefit sure. does Gorilla actually give us? The stats say, what, 20% improvement on accuracy? So that means if we wrote 100 separate API fetches, maybe, um, I don't know, um, whereas 80 would have succeeded before, now 100 succeed, or? Um, eight would have succeeded, now 10 succeed. Is, is, it seems like a marginal difference. Is it worth us considering um, using it in AutoGPT at some point in the future, or is it close enough to what the performance we can expect with um, GPT-4 plus the ability to look stuff up on the internet, uh, plus the ability to summarize? Is, is it actually something useful to us? What do you think? 
I think the the interesting thing about this is that they did just use a uh, 7 billion parameter model uh, that's open source. And so I guess this opens up the possibility for uh, local LLMs. Yeah. Right. Yes. And they're also using GPT-4 as some component in this. I guess I'm not totally clear on how the larger LLMs combine with Gorilla. Like, how do they interface? Was that used for the fine tuning step to yeah, generate use sample the... data? Yes, yes. Yeah, they, they use it to generate the data. Okay. I guess, like, I have a hard time seeing how we would implement this in all GPT because we need our base model to be able to do almost anything. And Gorilla, we would have to almost build like a sub LM that we only use for writing API calls. Well, um, that's the pipeline for the for the re-architecture. We're planning to abstract the LLM and even give the opportunity to, to choose which LLM to use for a given task. Like I mean, even beyond that, like you would. If you could choose your own LM, you choose like a high level one like Claude or GPT-4, but then if you choose a high level LM, we would like we would have to implement the ability to use almost two LMs because you'd want to use GPT-4 and Gorilla at the same time. Yeah, 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 ex ex exactly. So the idea is that you can use multiple LLMs within the, a single process and that there would be a decision making step, which LLM do you want? Do you want GPT-4, which is kind of clinical and dead? Or do you want Yannick's open assistant, which is pretty human-like and friendly? Or do you want Gorilla, which is fine-tuned to be expert at giving API um, code back to you? Or maybe there's going to be another one that's fine-tuned for coding or something like that. So would GPT-4 be choosing? Yeah, that's what my question is. Is that something that we would be choosing? Because if you just give, it, give GPT-4 a task of create an app, I don't know, for translation, uh, GPT-4 would choose which API to use and then so essentially would reach out to Gorilla, right? Yes, or to maybe put it more concisely in our, or, or accurately, in our main agent run loop, we would add a step that says, please choose the um, model to use next, here are your choices, and then whichever our master LLM is, we throw it through that master LLM to get the response. Um, and that master LLM probably is GPT-4. Yeah, this, this actually shows... Expensive, so we might use 3.5 to make that decision. If it's quite an easy decision to make, then why not just use 3.5? In some way, yeah. you're just updating the sub-LLM and not the foundation model, right? If there are new API updates, you're not updating it directly to GPT-4, only updating Gorilla. Correct. Go, go, gorilla, gorilla wouldn't need to update. Just the retriever would retrieve a different document. I'm still not sure exactly what is this retriever. I'm sorry, I might have missed. It. I must have missed it in the presentation, but I don't have a clear picture in my mind of what is this retriever in Gorilla. They don't yeah, fully yeah. explain it. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, like I guess, like. Everything I was able to glean about the retriever, and I, like, while Celine was giving the presentation, I was trying to find, like, every reference to BM25 and GPT index in the paper, and they really don't explain it that well. Um, like, that little piece I said about BM25, GPT index using text da Vinci, and then that oracle, uh, like, I think that's as much as we know about, from this paper about how the retriever works. They, they, they leave out a lot of things that seem... We have to second-guess them. Sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to uh, add on add on to what Sam was saying. They, they, they do leave out a lot of things that, that would have been interesting to see, such as the information retriever or how they're actually calling these APIs or, like, even the base code for how they're, uh, you know, as I mentioned, their, their get gorilla response uh, function isn't in the GitHub. So it feels like they just left out a lot of things. So I suppose we just have to imagine for this information retriever that they, um, like for the Oracle solution, they might involve a lookup, like AutoGPT would load a web page to look up documentation and then retrieve the web page contents and then summarize it in a vector store and um, uh, query against that vector store and 
then get a chunk of text that is basically copy pasted from the website and put that into the context window when querying Gorilla. Yeah, that yeah, sounds I get it. So that the like, query is made with a chunk of text, which hopefully contains the API call that you need. Yeah, I would really want to see the comparison of like Gorilla fine tuned on docs versus GPT-4 if you just give it like the web page of the documents that it's it needs to know as context uh because it feels almost like gorilla wouldn't be necessary if you were able to correctly retrieve the information that it's fine exactly. that relevant. is that's the hitting the nail on the head um yeah. e exactly if it becomes irrelevant with a system that can just fetch the web page and act over that web page then we kind of don't need to even think about it for to gpt because we're already doing it yeah, like as know, long as we know. can always like, find the relevant information on the web, and like that's the difficult part of this alternative implementation. But if we're able to do that, then I don't see why GPT-4 wouldn't just be able to use that context. Like it seems like fine tuning might not might not be the right approach for this kind of problem. But if you have yeah. complex tasks, so if you have complex tasks that involves multiple APIs from multiple places, you might want something like this, right? You can't give GPT for all of the documentation. That is a good point, yeah. Uh, like if if you needed the knowledge within one piece of code that you're trying to produce, if the knowledge you needed was more than you could feasibly fit in the GPT-4 context window, then you would get to a point where fine tune would really be the only option. Now that, that's quite an interesting thought to actually incorporate fine tuning in the operation of auto GPT. And this is a very future for thought, but if you are trying to solve a problem and you need to use the numpy library then rather than relying on um, gpt4's knowledge of numpy you could actually just load in the numpy documentation and do a quick fine tune of llama with that numpy documentation and then you've got a documentation reference that probably doesn't hallucinate the correct uh, apis for numpy functions which i notice is sometimes a problem generating code out of gpt4 sometimes it it hallucinates something. Yeah, oftentimes it seems like. Yeah, quite a lot. Sometimes I require three or four runs through a piece of code and spitting, the, pushing the error back through it to get actual actual working code. Uh, so I, I I can see a benefit of custom fine tuning a model to solve a task by just loading in the relevant frameworks, the tech stack, and kind of boning up on that tech stack. Yeah. It's pretty much how a human would do it, isn't it? If it's your job to work as a tech worker and here's a particular task, you're going to have to get a book on uh, MySQL or a book on Bash internals or whatever you need and then read up on those. That's how we all used to do it before the, um, the age of Google 20 years ago. Um, you, you get books and then you read the books on the topics you need and then you've primed yourself, optimized, you fine-tuned yourself to take out that task and you can work efficiently. Yeah, I think of like a fine tuning a whole model for like NumPy specifically it would be like sitting down and reading a whole NumPy textbook. But yeah. alternatively, the way that a lot, like most humans would figure out how to do a problem would be like Googling and then reading a few little paragraphs and then just finding out what's the most relevant. And that would be the approach where you just include context in the GPT-4 prompt. So, Interesting, huh? Two different ways to approach how to learn a library. Yes. Um, I I wonder. Um, I mean, I think a few days ago we were talking about like potentially in the future fine tuning a bunch of smaller models to do specific tasks, but I I'm confused as to why you think fine tuning models to like maybe do the numpy example makes sense because i would think we can just like vector embed the documentation and just use any model like I, see, yeah. like I was saying there are like there are two approaches that could both work for this solution or for this problem yes and it seems like vector embedding approach is the smarter approach because fine tuning is very fiddly expensive requires hardware it's a lot of faffling but a vector-based approach is just a few lines of code and it executes super fast and it works well. Uh, 
Yeah, I think the yeah. the way to go is to give like knowledge to the LLM at runtime instead of at training time. Yes. And then maybe on a much slower basis, you could collect training data and periodically update your LLM if you're a big company like OpenAI. Oh yeah, if you could, it'd be amazing to be able to fine tune GPT-4. Uh, yeah, that would be nice, huh? Although it would probably be a few hundred thousand dollars to create your own version. I mean, one of one of the things that uh, you know the fine tuning did help with was being able to understand how to modify things given the docs. That's that's something like that specifically benefits from the fine tuning. So even given GPT-4, if you could fine tune GPT-4 on uh, instruction, uh, you know, Oracle retrieved um, API, and then the correct response, then it would basically learn to use, uh, you know, the second half or the retrieved documentation to augment the API or the API call or write the API call. Yeah, that's a good point. Although I think it could probably be overcome with clever prompt engineering and like implementing an architecture. But yeah, that's a very good point, especially code modification seems like the place where it'd be the most difficult to match the capabilities of Gorilla. Yeah, as a human analogy, what do we commit to memory when we're working? What do we bother to commit to memory? And it's less and less as time goes on Certainly for myself, I remember when I used to code C++, I'd actually do exercises to memorize constructs. And over the last few years, I've just got in the habit of looking stuff up and pattern matching it. And I remember very little of the details. Uh, and now, um, since ChatGPT's come out, I've just been using it for all my code needs. I just have to remember that something can be done and roughly how to do it. And then I can nudge towards the details with ChatGPT and maybe look up some documentation if I need to. Yeah, other than like really specific API calls that GPT-4 almost always hallucinates, I've just been, I've almost stopped going to Stack Overflow for code snippets because I, you can just ask GPT-4 almost anything, anything yes. there, any question. I've stopped using Google at all. Yes, I've almost stopped using Google. Uh, one thing that's relevant, I remember a uh, very capable um, DSP engineer explaining to me once why I was failing to understand uh, digital signals. And he said, you can't just run at it, you know? Normally you can just run at things and muddle through them. Uh, but for s some things require a such a fine-tuned specific skill set that you actually have to do exercises in them. You have to go away and actually train your brain uh, to be able to deal with these constructs. Uh, and maybe that's an argument for fine tuning in LLMs. Maybe there are certain problem domains that are very niche, like signals processing, making digital filters. Uh, and a conventional LLM might not be able to, might not have the intellectual capacity to solve these problems. Uh, but one that is fine tuned on digital signals, um, digital filters questions, might be able to ace that task. So that might be a use for fine tuning. I think, yeah, I think that's true, right? I was going to say. Go ahead. We probably have like I think you're onto something where you're saying that, that we'll have a foundation LLM and then you'll have a set of specialized skilled LLMs that is then used in addition to the foundation LLMs, which is like how humans do it. We specialize as we grow older, like we choose different um, subjects at university. Yep. But we all have the same base understanding. We've all been to high school. Uh, we've all got English and maths GCSEs, probably. I can I can see there being a library of like fine tuned uh, LLMs as tools. Like they're they're basically just a tool that the base GPT four model can call like analyze code, but it's just Gorilla, and it knows that it's used specifically for, you know, not Gorilla, but whatever LLM that's fine tuned for signals processing or for specifically retrieving model APIs or whatever else it may be. So would it like, would, couldn't you get away with fine tuning the same base LLM in 10 different expert niche directions? Or would you actually want 10 separate base LLMs and fine tune each of those 10 in one direction? I guess it depends on what the task is and whether that task requires the fundamental 
basic understanding of the world that like you get from using a base LM, but if your like problem domain that you're trying to solve with this fine tune LM is extremely niche, then and you might not need, for example, all of the knowledge of Llama, but Llama is also a great example of like almost every fine tune model out there is a variant of Llama. Uh, and because of that you get the Llama's basic understanding of the world from the start out of the box. I'm just wondering what the price is when you specialize, uh, when you specialize in uh, an LLM, what's the cost of it? Does it actually get worse at general knowledge? Uh, does it get fuzzy at general information as it gets better at providing ex information over its ex domain of expertise? Catastrophic it's forgetting too... is a pretty big issue for fine tuning in general. It's the reason why uh, you know, OpenAI haven't released fine tuning for 3.5 or 4 yet, because if you fine tune, oftentimes it'll just forget like previous general information from its neural circuits. Okay, so that's a very strong argument for a host of specialized fine tuned LLMs. You still need to use it with the foundation LLM, even if you have the specialized LLMs, right? Um, no, no. You, you you start with the base LLM and then you just iteratively update the weights on it as you're passing through your fine tuning training data. Well, like within AutoGPT, the base LLM would be using the fine tuned LLMs as tools. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. It, it, iteratively fine tuning. I think there has been research on that before. It's like there's just the the as I mentioned, catastrophic forgetting is just taken to the extreme where. The pre training, a lot of the information from the free pre training is just forgotten, and model performance as a whole just goes down. It makes sense. It's just like humans, isn't it? You put all of your energy into one thing, and then, like, I'm putting all my energy into auto GPT, and I've lost my touch with world politics. I have no idea what's going on anymore. <laughs> yeah. Same deal. Uh, Pi, do you think uh, now that we have the R&D meetings running or running earlier in the day, do you think it's worth still having a implementation discussion in the hour after Voyager on Friday? Not. Maybe we don't need that. Maybe we can just go through the paper and do a discussion after it as normal. Yeah, it seems like we are already discussing the Voyager paper and the R&D chat so yeah. i don't think it'll be worth discussing it again yes okie doke thank you everyone i'm gonna head off of course if there's a if there's no nothing else that someone wants to bring up i guess that's a reading group adjourned thank you see you all next time yeah thank you celine for presenting of course yeah, good yeah, thanks. Thanks. thanks